All right, so I'm here with Cameron O'Connell. This is the first time we've met. Uh, it's 2 a.m. in England um, now as we're recording this. I apologize. 8.30 p.m. is the only time I can record these uh, because of my kids and my job. But thank you so much, Cameron, for being on the show. Hey, Dave. Thanks so much for having me, man. It's an absolute pleasure. <laughs> so tell me about yourself. Uh, this is the first time we've met. Uh, we've talked on Instagram. We've kind of communicated back and forth. Um, and I'm happy to have you on. And uh, I, I know a lot of our listeners probably can relate to you because uh, based on what I've seen on your YouTube channel, on, on your Instagram account, I think a lot of our listeners are, are just like you. So tell me about yourself, um, what you do for work. And um, yeah, I mean, England, where, where in England are you, are you, do you live? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm based in Southampton in the UK, which is, as you can probably guess, as south as you can go. Um, yeah. It's probably about an hour, hour from London, but um, I'm originally from Cambridge, but I do a lot of work in London and in and amongst the south of England. Um, okay. But yeah, I'm a freelance camera operator and video producer. I delve into a little bit of photography here and there. And yeah, I create content for brands and production companies and agencies and pretty much just get paid to shoot content daily. That's awesome. So unlike a lot of um, the recent episodes that I've had of, you know, working YouTubers, you're actually a working like videographer freelancer. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, in a way, like, I mean, like, um, I mean, I'm still pretty fresh. Like I've only been kind of freelance for probably like three or four years. Um, and I do delve a little into YouTube. So I wouldn't say I'm like so far on one end of it, well, one end of the scale, but um, I'm somewhere in the middle. But if you actually checked out my YouTube channel, you'd see that, um, yeah, I don't post very often. So, uh. <laughs> And one of the things that uh, we connected on is retro games. You mentioned that you're a big retro gamer. So I, I set up my, my Tetris uh, on the NES over here running. If you're watching the video, you'll see it on a loop here. I've got my NES system hooked up to a new PVM that I just bought um, off of Facebook Marketplace for 200 bucks. It's like a steal for this thing. But um, are you are you a retro gamer yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I delve in and out of games as much as, as possible and much as, as I can. But um, yeah, it's just something about like the old hardware that just feels so good. Yeah. Like, I don't know about you, but like, emulators I, i've tried them all i've given them all a go but it yeah. just doesn't quite have the same effect i agree 100 percent. i i have the um what's it called the the really popular one that's on the on mac uh open emu i think yeah, yeah um it's it's a great app it's actually really solid and you can play even in 64 games on it and ps ps1 games if you really wanted to but it's no, it's not the same. There's there's input delay. There's always glitches I've found in things too. I mean, some of the older games um, are are pretty flawless, but like the any N sixty four games and stuff like that. I know N sixty four in particular is hard to emulate, is in theory. Um, but I don't know if you've been seeing in the news, Analog, the company, they had this great new product, the Analog Pop Pocket, that just came out. And all the reviews yeah, yeah. that I've seen of that looks incredible. It's basically, it's, it's an FPGA, I think is what that type of technology is called, where okay. it doesn't emulate the game virtually. It, it, it emulates the system and then it plays the games as if it's playing on the system. It's a, it's a, it's a different type of emulation. You're emulating the system itself. And then that allows you to, in theory, put in cartridges, original cartridges uh, into it. And they say that that's a better way to emulate is to actually emulate the system. And then that way you can still play original media, but um, it's real expensive and time consuming. And yeah, when yeah. you play it, when you, when you actually get a CRT television and start playing retro games on a CRT, it changes the whole thing. Cause it's like, it's just so that's what it was designed to be played on. And if you can get a hold of an old CRT somewhere, no matter where you live, just find one. You know, if your grandma still has one or somebody's trying to give one away. I know in the UK, it's actually expensive and sometimes hard to get uh, CRTs, at least in some of the forums I've seen. 
guys in the UK who are like, I'm, I'm so jealous of the Americans who just pick up these things on the side of the road. But um, yeah, I don't know yeah. if that's true. But have you messed around with CRT televisions yet? Um, I mean, in my my childhood, like in my youth, absolutely, yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, any of the like high spec kind of actual decent CRT screens that I think retro gamers sought yeah. after, um, yeah, I, I can't say I've had much experience with them. But from what I've seen, they all they're surprisingly like sharp and like high definition yeah. from from what I remember, you know. Well. Yeah, so this is a th- again. Sorry, sorry, everybody who's listening who's not interested in this because this is a a film and photo podcast. But Cameron and I will, will <laughs> uh, nerd out about this. Um, oh, this is a this is a RGB modified NES. So I don't know if you know anything about that, but basically you can actually the, the original NES system uh, was not capable of RGB output um, out of the box, which is like. I don't want to get into the technicalities of it, but basically RGB is kind of what everything is now. And it basically sends out each color sample individually. So it's just a sharper, cleaner image. Back in the Uh old days, it was just too expensive to do that. And you would never see the quality difference. But people have figured out a way to modify these to add like a custom made chip. You solder it on there and then you just you get RGB out, which gives you a really sharp, clean image straight out of the NES. Yeah, yeah, nice. And then that goes into here, and this is a PVM, which this would be like the equivalent of a Apple Cinema Display XDR or whatever, like a, yeah, yeah. You know, of the time. This was like what filmmakers would use for color grading and stuff. So, um, yeah, no. It's pretty fun. Absolutely, and, yeah, I mean. I don't know. It's it, I'm nerding out about it, but it's been a fun passion <laughs> of mine the last year. Yeah, yeah, I, I noticed that. Um, but yeah, I love the old Pokemon games. I love um, all the PlayStation 1 titles. Um, I love the GameCube, <laughs> the GameCube games. Like, that. that's the oh, kind yeah. of era I'm in, you know. Any, <clears throat> any further back than that, like, you know, um, the NES and um, the Commodore 64, I don't quite go that far, but... Yeah. Maybe one day, maybe one day, yeah. So... Talk to me, Cameron, about the Canon R3 because um, you may know a little bit about it, and I'm curious about it. I've never used one. Uh, have you used one? And let's talk about it because I think it's uh, one of the top flagship cameras out there from Canon right now. Um, do you own one or have you messed around with one? Um, so I don't own one yet, but Ooh. I I was in B&H in New York City last week and... Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I got my hands on one, and yeah, I was quite impressed. Well, kinda. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about. Yeah. So, what what, yeah. Are, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, I've got the One DC here. Uh, this is my little baby that I lusted after for years when it was like fifteen thousand um, dollars. Then once it finally dropped down in price, finally got one. Um, this would be considered like the flagship of the time. And now the R3 is kind of the flagship from Canon. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Have, do you have any experience with the 1D series and playing around with the R3? Um, what are your takeaways? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, I shot on, well, I've been shooting on the 1D series cameras for about six years now. Oh, cool. I picked up the, I picked up the 1DC in 2016 or 2015, what? I think it was. Oh my gosh. You're a 1DC guy? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I didn't know um, that. I mean, I I jumped straight from the uh, the 5D2 straight to the 1DC. And um, Heck yeah. Yeah, I, lo- I loved it. Like the the weight, the size, the ergonomics, the uh-huh. all day all day battery life, you know. And like just the size of the buttons because you're able to but, you know, with the 1D, I was able to basically navigate the entire camera without even having to look at it. Yeah. Because the buttons were so big and so conveniently laid out. You know, it was almost like a games console or like a Game Boy yeah. or something like that, you know. But, um, yeah, so I shot on the <laughs> 1DC for like two or three years. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was an absolute tank. It It was just, you know, the dream camera, but... The log profiles on it weren't really like good for eight bit. 
So yeah. I was never really able to get the image out of it I wanted. But um, did you, yeah, then I did uploaded you shoot... to the... Sorry, I think we have sorry, a little more... That? I just Sorry, I think we do have a little more delay than normal just because I'm... Our internet's going across the pond, um, but <laughs> I, I was I was saying, uh, did you ever mess around with the motion JPEG codec on it? Um, it was always such a pain to deal with at the time, but um, I found the log to be fairly usable when you would shoot in the 4K mode. But it's definitely nowhere near what it's at, you know, nowadays with 10 bit. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, did, well, because I because I wanted the uh, the slow motion, I had to shoot the 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 1080 oh, yeah. even just to get 60 the 1080p um, I, full frame mode on this was terrible it really was <laughs> yeah it really was um yeah that and you know the the 1.3 crop factor was mm -hmm. like just enough to annoy me that i just would shoot the 1080 image just to get the full frame <laughs> look sure yeah but um yeah i mean to be fair when i had the 1dc it was quite early in my career so i i had a lot of you know i was making a lot of mistakes outside of the camera but um sure yeah i moved from the 1dc to the 1dx2 nice and i shot i shot on the 1dx2 for yeah about another another three years nice yeah i think the 1080p and... got a lot better on that camera um and then obviously they added the autofocus which was a huge um huge addition with the video obviously yeah yeah absolutely i mean you know i was always a manual focus guy like i i laughed at the idea of autofocus in a video camera <laughs> and then um my brother had the uh the canon 70d like mm -hmm. while i still had the 1dc and he showed me how good the dual pixel autofocus was and you know that he could perfectly track subjects at like f18 or f14 and it actually worked. I was I was blown away. So um yeah, I moved over to the 1DX2 and um yeah, shot on that for another 3 years and it was uh it was a dream of a camera. You know, it I did probably 2-300 projects with it and it never failed me. The Peter McKinnon camera. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, that was it. He kind of made it famous. Um not that it wasn't already famous, but I think a lot more 1DX2s were sold once he started blowing up, for sure. <laughs> no, I think you're right, yeah. But um so yeah, then I then I uh I made a review of the 1DX2 on YouTube, which was probably about two and a half years ago now. Mm. And um yeah, it basically it compiled like all the footage of all the projects I'd shot over the years. Um yeah, and it kind of just kicked off. It was the first ever YouTube video I ever really made. And um, mm -hmm. it just, like, skyrocketed. Like, every time I would check back on it, it had, like, a thousand extra views. And I was like, hold on. Like, <laughs> somehow this has actually worked out. But, um... Yeah. I think I've yeah. actually, now that I'm... Incredible camera. I'm... Uh, I can't I can't share my screen because this is the first time I've opened Zoom and it's ask, asking me to go to system preferences and enable something and oh, then no. restart Zoom. I was going to share the screen <laughs> so that people could see, but everybody go to Video Cameron uh, on YouTube and check out the Canon 1DX Mark II one-year review, a cinematographer's video perspective. Um, it's got 177,000 views at the time of this recording. Really beautiful footage, a lot of like firsthand experience uh pointers and tips and stuff here um and now that i see the thumbnail and stuff i think i actually watched this like back when it came out for sure because i was super into all that at that time as well so yeah killer thumbnail huh. just like simple clean hey thanks man that, that i think wooden... you even commented on it as well oh i did <laughs> okay yeah well then i did see it <laughs> you're right yeah yeah amazing review wow bravo <laughs> two years ago you pinned it <laughs> you pinned my comment <laughs> i wish i was sharing the screen here um, what can i say oh and then yeah you say thanks dave love your videos are you still using the one dc and i said i sold it unfortunately but i've been using the r with the atomos ninja v anyways i i, I lied because i ended up buying another one <laughs> but that was two years yeah, ago absolutely interesting but, um, i might have yeah i no, might have to look into that <laughs> 
Everybody go on <laughs> go on this video and you could see my conversation with Cameron two years ago, which I forgot about. I'm so sorry about that. Um I definitely and remember I'm watching more. it though. Now that I see the thumbnail and rewatch the video here, I definitely remember this video. It's a killer video. So Thank you. But yeah, it was um it was you know, it was my first ever YouTube video and you know, it was just the awesome taste of kind of what could be possible if you just put yourself out there, you know? Yeah. What but, did you um, think yeah, of so that? I... Sorry. I, I want to stay on this topic real quick, that video, because I yeah, think it's yeah, interesting. Of course. Of course. Um, so that really was like, if you sort by most popular, that is your most popular video still um, to this day. That was two years ago and it was your first video what what do you think you learned from from that moment uh now that you've posted more videos obviously um i think that's an interesting like most people don't have that type of experience where you get a viral video on your first uh go around and how did it even go viral was it shared somewhere or did it just kind of happen with the algorithm um yeah i mean well i wouldn't say it was my first ever video but it was my first ever kind of attempt at uploading something to youtube that i wanted people to actually see um, yeah no yeah it's actually yeah, I, technically I, not your actual first youtube video you've got five other videos before that but it's the first one where you did like a review and you it looks like you definitely put thought into the thumbnail yeah, yeah. and stuff like that that was it yeah well, i mean well, it was the first time i ever spoke to the camera um but yeah i don't really know what made it made it kick off like I mean, I kind of had a bit of a strategy when I posted it in that I I shared it on Reddit, I shared it on Facebook, I shared it on Instagram, and there I just go. spammed every everyone and every person I knew to kind of watch it. And I was just asking them to kind of try to spark the algorithm because I kind yeah. of knew how YouTube worked in a way that if you if you had a certain number of interactions in the first... 24 hours then youtube kind of snowballed your your video and then pushed you into other categories mm -hmm. yeah but i don't absolutely. think it was That's... that alone yeah i don't think it was that alone i think it was um i think yeah, the, thumb, I <laughs> the video i mean i commented on it and i remember watching it now and it was a great video like i watched the whole thing so obviously that counts you know for youtube's algorithm if People watch the entire video. Um, the thumbnail made me click on it because it's just a beautiful picture. And in my previous episode last week with um, Gary, the Everyday Dad, he brought up a great point. When it, when it comes to thumbnails for the camera review space or the tech review space, you don't really need to have like a crazy face. You know, you don't have to do the YouTuber face necessarily, like the David Dobrik or the Mr. Beast expression. Um, the thumbnail just has to be is what in his words acceptable and the title really tells the story uh which i think is an interesting way to look at it and i kind of agree with them based on my experience um some of the biggest videos that i made um don't have my face in them at all and it's just the product and then obviously you know a lot of my friends make fun of me for my stupid crazy faces that i would make on thumbnails but that's just my personality and i enjoy being goofy um, but it's like, uh, I guess it doesn't really matter cause it's a 90% male audience and a bunch of dudes don't want to see another dude's face on a thumbnail. It's kind of like, eh, okay, whatever, dude, what, what, what do you think has got going on here, man? You know, I don't know. It's just, uh, as I actually think about it, the way I consume content, uh, you know, seeing Armando's crazy face doesn't necessarily make me want to click on it, but a sexy picture of his FX3 makes me want to want to click on it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um I guess kind of what it taught me was that I didn't have to be this kind of overly um dramatic kind of YouTuber, you know, a Casey Neistat or a Peter McKinnon. Yeah. I could literally just be me. I could be a miserable English camera <laughs> reviewer. And um, did you say miserable? <laughs> yeah, well, y you know, <laughs> you're not miserable in, in, in ways. No, no, of course not. But um, 
but you know but, like, i grew up watching i grew up watching like philip bloom and um yeah people like sean sean tucker do you know sean tucker no i don't he does um really in-depth uh videos about photography and like the art of photography and so many oh, different wow. topics inside of photography like really detailed and really um yeah sean tucker a philosoph uh, a philosophical approach to life and capturing light that's his tagline very yeah. uh very heady looks like a guy who reads a lot of books that's awesome yeah check it out is he british he is british yeah i'm yeah. pretty sure yeah, yeah he's from the uk that's what it says yep cool yeah i mean did we all grew up with philip bloom i mean that's why i got the one dc is mr mr philip um he he suckered me into it I, and i've been obsessed ever since <laughs> um yeah and it, that's what i love about youtube so much is, and why i transitioned into it full time four years ago was i found that i could really be myself as an artist and express myself in my unique way and even though some people might hate it um there are people who also are like me and have a similar sense of humor and, and enjoy the same things that I enjoy. And that's what's so amazing about the internet is that it really, you know, makes the world feel small because we're all able to connect with one another. I mean, here we are right now. I mean, you're in the UK and I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, and we're having a conversation as if we're, you know, sitting in the same room. It, it really, I mean, I, I know people are probably rolling their eyes. It's like, yeah, the internet has been a thing. Like Skype has been around before <laughs> this podcast. It's not anything new. It's just, I'm still a very, uh, I don't know, optimistic guy. And I'm appreciative of this uh, time that we live in. And that's what's so great is that you could be yourself. You don't have to try to be overly funny or crazy. You can just be yourself and other people will be attracted to that and find it. It's, it's really a freeing thing as an artist. Yeah, that's it. And like, I, um, yeah, it just, it just taught me that I didn't have to be someone else. I could just be myself and I could just put myself out there on the internet. And 95% of the feedback that I got was just lovely and, you know, inspiring to create more. So yeah, I really, I really did plan to create more YouTube content as well, to be fair. But um, in the last kind of two years, my my freelance camera operator career has just kicked off, and That's yeah, awesome. I've just struggled, struggled, struggled to find the time, to be honest. But um, I'm hoping to pick back up on it, to be honest. Well, yeah, I mean, I would encourage you to do so. I know for me, um, I had to cut things out, like I had to. When I was when I started Kinotika, I was still doing freelance on the side while I started it. And there was a certain point where we were making just enough money with Kinotika to live. It, it really wasn't a lot at all. It was below what we needed to make. I say we because I was married. So um, and I asked my wife, I was like, I basically said, I love YouTube. I love being a YouTuber. I have a gut feeling that if I just spent a year of only doing YouTube that it would pay off and like we're barely making enough off of it now, but I bet if I just hustle for the next couple of months, we'll get to a more comfortable level. Um, but for a couple of months, it's going to be pretty tight, but I'm going to start saying no to everything that comes in because I want to do YouTube and that's all I want to do. And thankfully I had a wife who really trusted me in that and she let me go for it. And, uh, we were tight financially for about three months, but, it, you know, but it ended up working out and really grateful for that, um, that year. And my son was, was born at the time, but he was like an infant. So I, and I only had one. So, um, it was a little bit easier to do this. Now that I have two, I've got a four year old and a two year old. Um, it's become more challenging to find time, uh, to do it, but Anyways, I'm I'm going freelance. I've been full time with my cousins. Long story, but I've been full time with my cousins this year, doing some work for them, and then I'm going freelance next year. So I'm excited to get back into YouTube. But that's easy to say. Obviously, um, it's hard to do. And um, I would encourage you if it's something you want to do, like find time 
on the weekends or whatever, but I don't know. Are you married? Do you have kids and stuff like that? Uh, neither. Okay. Well then, <laughs> then do it on the weekends, I guess. <laughs> like, cause for me right now, like the, from, uh, five until eight is like my sacred, like, like, you know, I'm not willing to give that up with my kids and my wife. So, um, and then the weekends too, I don't work on the weekends cause, uh, to spend time with family. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's easy to say hard to do for sure. And when you're freelance, it yeah, feels yeah. like you're when you're a freelancer and tell me if, if I'm right on this, it feels like you're always working. Cause it's like, even if you finish a shoot, if you're doing editing on, you know, you, there's always an edit that you're working on. And then somebody calls you and like, Hey, are you free on Friday? Yeah, I'm free. And then you just go do a shoot like last minute. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to do it. Cause it, like things come up all the time when you're freelance and you have to say yes. Yeah, no, you're right. It's, um, the way I kind of see it is that I feel like I'm always working and I feel like I'm never working at the same time. <laughs> I'm kind of just in this, in this limbo of kind of, I do what I love every day, kind of off my own, off my own clock. You know, I can choose what I do when I want to do it. I can, yeah. I can turn down jobs. I can, um, I can approach clients and kind of look for work that way. But, um, yeah, there's always an edit. There's always an edit. I'm never edit free. And I know. I'm always backlogged. <laughs> that's it. And if if it's not editing, then it's pre-production for a passion project or you know um, a, a shoot that I know that I've got coming up, or I don't know, or I'm screwing around with camera gear, buying lenses that I don't need. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> well. We were we were leading up into the R3 and your thoughts on the R3. Um, I know there's another camera purchase yes. that happened here too because I've seen your Instagram and that's the 1DX Mark III, which at some point you got as well. Yeah, so the 1DX3 on paper was perfect. It solved all the issues that I had. Well, almost all the issues that I had with the 1DX2. <laughs> You know, it gave me the full frame 4K. It gave me some of the mirrorless uh, features. It gave me, um, you know, better autofocus. And it was better stills, better sensor, better low light. It was everything. Apart from one, one feature that no one ever talks about. And actually, if you wanted to look into buying the 1DX3 today, still, no one talks about it. Have you got oh, any guesses that? on what it might be? Have oh, you got any guesses? Um, okay. Is it video related? It's video related. Um, well, it is an EF mount, but people have talked about that. Um, so that's not necessarily it. Um, the codecs are pretty good, so I don't think it's the codec. Autofocus is great. Um, there's RAW, but it's like super... And everybody's talked about that. Uh, I don't know. What 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 is it? I give up. <laughs> uh, roll, rolling shutter. Oh, okay. Yeah, rolling shutter. Okay. Is it really bad? So, is it is it similar to this one, the one DC? Like ten times worse. Oh, it's worse. Okay. <laughs> like imagine like imagine like the the rolling shutter on the camera on your like the dash cam of your car. Uh-huh. <laughs> or like In the fact, Sony, those old Sony like A6300s had really bad rolling shutter as well. Yeah, but there's almost no need for it really. Like there's, you know, it's a great sensor and, you know, they've got the um, the processing power behind it all. But yeah, yeah basically if, you're, if your subject wasn't stood still, you couldn't shoot it. The whole image oh, wow. would just turn to jelly. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Was that in just the standard 4K modes? It was uh, basically any of the full frame, high resolution modes. Yeah. Okay. You know, did um, have you ever followed uh, Andrew Reed's website EOSHD.com? Yeah, yeah no, I think, it sounds familiar. I feel like he may have talked about it a little bit on his website, but um, he's he's 
not he's the first to kind of complain about things uh and he's great at it i think he's a great writer and he's hilarious we've actually had him on the podcast Uh, i met him at photokina and i think he's just a riot um because he just he gets really he gets really worked up about cameras (laughs) but uh yeah i mean I feel like on paper, the 1DX Mark III was everything that I always wanted this 1DC to be. Like, you might as well just call the 1DX three the 1DC Mark II. Like, you know, um, it had RAW, it had autofocus, it had log that was really good, great codecs. They changed the motion JPEG, so you're not dealing with that crappy motion JPEG codec anymore. Um, but you're saying it was essentially unusable. And then also... Um, obviously we all knew too, by the time the one DX three came out, the RF, uh, series of cameras already existed. I think the EOS R already came out. So it was kind of like, we've already like Canon already said like publicly that we are discontinuing EF. Like we are not making any more EF lenses. This is it. Everything that we've made, like, I guess, I guess they're just either selling stuff that they already made, or maybe they're still making the lenses they're just not developing new lenses i guess is what it is but um rf is the future and yet the 1dx3 came out and the reason is that year was uh <laughs> it was the covid year i think right and so that was the year when the olympics were supposed to happen 2020 but obviously we know how that went <laughs> yeah absolutely and um yeah so i i I had the uh, the one DX three for probably about four or five months, maybe now maybe a bit longer, maybe six or seven months. Okay. And I loved it. Like it was, it it fixed so many problems for me in the one D series. But the rolling shutter in video was just yeah. You just couldn't do anything anything with it. So basically, you either shot HD full frame, or you shot in the one point three crop. Mm, which is like and that was yeah if you're spending that, wasn't that the reason kind of I bought money, that camera if you're spending that kind of money on it like you're not using it for what it, it's what you're spending your money on at that point so like what's the point so yeah no, okay you're so, right and so, so yeah you the R3. A, um yeah r3 so obviously so the r3 is supposed to be the the mirrorless version of a 1d right or or is it not is that kind of what they're saying? Yeah, kind of. I think it's um they they're kind of putting it in between what they're calling the 1DX3 and or what will replace the 1DX3 and the R5. And having I've not really shot anything with it yet, but having held it in my hands, I'd say it's still not quite a 1D. Mm-hmm. It feels like an R5 or an R6 with a battery grip which is great Mm -hmm. but it's you know you could do that for half the price well probably a third of the price right yeah assuming assuming that you don't need all the extra features sure and my interview with um motocross or motorsport photographer jamie price um he explains why these hefty dslrs are still so widely used in sports and journalism it is the ruggedness and the build of it like uh, you know you hand this camera i again listeners i'm I'm holding the one dc in my hand right now um holding this camera to a normal person they would say this thing is huge but once you start to use it it's just perfect like your hand fits so perfectly around it the weight of it adds to the stability of it I never, I took this thing to Alaska in negative 20 degrees uh, and I was using gloves and barely any, like I, only a slit for my eyes to see. And I was able to fully operate this camera because it's designed for all the elements. Um, and we're still not there yet with these mirrorless cameras, especially from Sony. Don't even get started with Sony. Like the A1 uh, camera is very uh, technologically advanced and really impressive but it's still just another a7 body it's not which is a small mirrorless uh, camera 
So I feel like the the real pro uh, sports photographers, journalists, the people taking all the photos at all the political um, events, none of them have really transitioned. I, I don't see them using uh, mirrorless that often. And it's it's because I feel like nobody's really served them the right thing yet, except maybe Nikon. I've, I've heard a lot of good things about that Z9 camera. Um, did you hold that one while you were at B&H? Uh, to be honest, I've not touched a Nikon camera or a, a Nikon, as you guys call it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've not touched a Nikon camera in probably about eight years. I've heard a lot of great things about the, the Nikon uh, Z9, as the Canadians say. Or do you say Z as well? Yeah, we it, do. Yeah, or Z okay, or Z. Okay, so, yeah. so that... <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, can, Canada is is sort of part of your community, so that's why they say Zed. But ah, um, okay, gotcha. <laughs> right? I mean, Canada. Don't they? Isn't the Queen of England something to do with Canada as well? I don't know. Yeah, there's something to do with the the Commonwealth. Yeah, whatever. That has a link between <laughs> the UK and Canada, but um. But yeah, no, the, the Z9, I've heard good things about it. You know, it's got yeah. like the 8K, it's got the slow motion, it's got, um, you know... The, there's no the... shutter. <laughs> there's no rolling shutter oh, in that camera because there's no mechanical shutter. <laughs> the The rolling shutter oh. performance is like unbelievable. Um, go watch... Um, my favorite review of that camera is um, Good Friends of the Show, DP uh, Review, uh, what what was it? DP review Jordan Drake and uh, and Chris Nichols. Yes, they did a great video on um, on it. So go check. Yeah, that so out. I'm DP waiting review for TV. their. That's it. Yeah, I'm waiting for their their review of the R three four video because mm. I know they've done one for stills, which is great. Um, and they briefly touch on video, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah. like just just the just the uh, list a couple of reasons why. I think I'll go for the R3. Um, you know, it kind of is the the 1DX style body that gives me all day battery life. It's weather sealed. It's rugged. I can throw it around. You know, it's got the large buttons. It's got the battery grip built in. Um, yeah. And obviously that 30 frames a second is pretty fun. I'd assume. <laughs> and you're, so, and uh, you're kind of, you really are a hybrid user, right? Like it sounds like, that's the it. reason you the reason you choose these these flagship cameras is because in theory they're the best of the video from a, a hybrid and they're the best of the stills of a hybrid as well yeah no that's it I mean I totally understand where video cameras have their the place. c7 the c70 is great I, I'm like a lot of the th issues that you're talking about like I love my c70 that's what I'm using right now it's awesome I I wouldn't consider going to an R3 because the C70 solves all my problems. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, I've got a C70 and a C200 as well as my, uh, my R5. Okay. <laughs> okay. So and, um, I love it too. And I love it too. Yeah. yeah, I love it too. But I know that there's a time and place for a hybrid camera mm -hmm. and to be fair, there are things that annoy me about the C70 as well. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. the The fact that it's a crop sensor is really the main one for me. It's it's obnoxious that it the it has an RF mount, at, which is a great mount. All the RF lenses are wonderful, but it's a crop sensor, so I have to use. Of course, I don't have to, but I'm choosing to use the Turbo Booster to give me that equivalent full frame. <laughs> Now I'm going the backwards. Turbo booster. And, yeah, the turbo booster. I'm I'm essentially going backwards in time using EF glass on it. Um and it makes it much heavier and bigger. But that being said, EF glass is great. It's tried and true. There's nothing wrong with EF glass. I mean, I'm using the 16 to 35 28 version 3 on here and it's wonderful. It's super sharp. It's I have no issues with it. So I don't need to complain too much because it still is like the C70 is ultimately what I wanted out of the 1DC. Um, and with the Turbo Booster, it's actually the same kind of equivalent crop as well as the 1DC, that 1 1.3 crop. Um, so anyways, uh, 
<laughs> I'm happy with it. But yeah, so yeah, no. Are you considering going? So I I didn't know you owned an R5. So are you gonna sell your R5 and get an R3? Is that your plan? Uh, yeah, I think my perfect setup is the C70 for my A cam. You know, interviews. Um, you know, working for production companies that require certain codecs or. You know, if they want that C log two, then they've got it. Mm -hmm. um, and then an R three for stills, hybrid, and gimbal work. Because getting yeah. the getting the C seventy on a gimbal is doable, but it's um, you know, it if you if you hold that setup in your arms for nine hours, it's not all that much fun. Oh yeah, I mean, it, it's a small camera for sure for a cinema camera, but. Um, when you're hand holding it, it gets it gets heavy quick. Um, that's why I ended up getting the Easy Rig, the Easy Rig Mini Max, uh, with my C70. With the work I've been doing this year with my cousins, we go out and shoot for like ten hours, and I'm just hand holding it all day. And my back was killing me, my arms were killing me. And the Easy Rig, if you've never used the Easy Rig, it is amazing. Like I really, I'll, I'll never go back. Like I prefer it over a monopod now for sure. Um, you still get that kind of handheld look with it and aesthetic, but you don't get any fatigue at all. It's awesome. I love it. Yeah, I've given one a go for a shoot. Um, I was working for a client, uh, do you know Kraken, Kraken Rum? Okay, yeah. They're like, a, I think they're a UK company. But um, yeah, we were doing a shoot for Kraken and um, yeah, we rented Easy Rigs for it and it was nice having yeah the weight on my hips instead of in my arms but uh yeah i don't know i just i guess i just need a bit of practice with it i find that when you're <laughs> on longer lenses when you're on longer lenses it was actually adding camera shake to my to my shot yeah. but no it, it definitely does you have to um you get used to it like i, I it's it's kind of got a knack to it I don't know if you ever used the Glidecam HD 4000 before gimbal, but like uh, any of those little handheld steady cams that are just balanced with counterweights, like those types of things just take a lot of kind of practice and you kind of have to learn the knack of it. Once you figure it out, you uh, it kind of becomes second nature. And I haven't, I haven't had any issues with bouncy footage really with it. Um, then again, I'm never super long lens on it. Like I usually keep the 16 to 35 on it. And then occasionally I'll go to the 24 to 105. And of course, when you zoom into 105, you see it, but, um, yeah, so you're, you're, you're not wrong that you, you get, it adds bumps to it, but maybe it, maybe you're using one that was a little too, uh, strong. Like I, I bought like a Chinese knockoff one that was, was able to hold, a lot of weight and i didn't realize that there's actually a weight limit on the bottom end as well like it basically was pulling my camera up and i was having to pull the camera down because it had too much tension on it because it was designed yeah, for yeah. a heavier rig and so i returned that got the mini max and that's designed for cameras that are four pounds up to like eight pounds and the little c70 is only like six pounds or something so um that worked perfectly now it's like it's just it's as if it's just floating in front of my hands it's nuts and i can just hold it with one hand and like drink a coffee in the other hand it's great <laughs> yeah no i'll have to um i'll have to give one another go because uh yeah it's been a, i do like the weight of the c70 i mean i've even got the uh the cage on mine with the handles and all that yeah so if anything i'm adding i'm adding weight to mine but um you know, I like hand holding the C70, but it's just getting it on a gimbal that, you know, yeah. it literally just about balances on my RS2. Yeah. Yeah, and you're if right. I, it, if I had an R, a little big. Yeah. If I had an R3 that I could just pop on and off, get similar video B-roll. Sure. With better, better autofocus and I know have the ability that, to jump, jump into stills when needed. I, sorry, we keep cutting each other off because of our delay here. But um, and also, I, I interrupt the guests a lot, so I apologize, uh, listeners. <laughs> um, but <laughs> you're so right. Like the the it's frustrating, isn't it? How the R5 and you know obviously now the new R3 
they have a better user interface and a better design with the autofocus. Like they both share um, the dual pixel autofocus, like the C70 obviously has dual pixel autofocus and it has the wonderful face only mode or face priority mode, which I really love, which prioritize the autofocus only on the face. So I'm using that right now because I've had problems in the past where the camera will actually focus on the microphone in front of me because it's closer to the camera rather than my face. But with the face only mode, it stays locked on my face. And even if it loses my face for a second, it just stays where it was. I don't know why more cameras don't do that. Like the a7S III, for example, I feel like that could be like a software feature. They could just add to it and it would make that camera even better. But um, but yeah, the R3, the R5, all the, the R's, <laughs> they have, uh, they have better autofocus. Like, I don't know if it's better. It's just the user interface is better, I guess, or the, the software is better. I found, yeah, the, um, the C70 can, it can autofocus well in good light. You know, like I use it for interviews all the time. Um, I do use it for B-roll, but I just find it so unpredictable. I'll I'll be yeah. doing a shoot and there'll be an obvious contrasty scene that I'm shooting and then it will just hunt just out of nowhere. I don't know if that's because I'm shooting on EF lenses with the speed booster as well. Maybe going to RF would solve yeah. that issue. I don't know. I so I only use the twenty four to one oh five version two and then the sixteen to thirty five version three. And both of those are officially supported with the turbo booster, but I put the 50 millimeter one, two L on it yesterday. And I noticed that the focus went off, um, throughout my shoot. And I remember when I put that lens on, there's a dialogue that pops up and says, this lens is just so you're aware, this lens is not fully supported yet. So I think there, I don't know what lenses you're using. Are you using any that are technically, you know, uh officially supported or whatever um i'm not entirely sure i mean yeah it gives me that same warning when i pop a lens on my camera as well okay but, um well then yeah no i use the 16 to 35 the... the 24 to 70 the 70 to 200 and then i use some of the sigma art primes and actually i find the sigma art primes sometimes perform better than the canon lenses which is so odd. <laughs> it's so strange. I mean, I, I guess you got to hand it to the engineers. It's probably, there's probably a lot of interesting technology going on, converting the signal from RF to EF and making that all work with the speed booster. So, you know, I don't want to get too fussy about it because it's got to be somewhat complicated. Otherwise it would, it would all just work perfectly. Um, obviously this, the real solution would be if first off, if the C70 had a full frame, uh, sensor, then we would only use RF on it. <laughs> but then, uh, if it, I'm okay with the crop sensor, I don't mind super 35. It's been a, a trusted, you know, format for years. So I, I, I would prefer full frame, but I really don't mind super 35. I just wish if they're going to give me super 35, they'd give me crop lenses. So like, I wish they made like RF crop lenses, like a, a Sigma 18 to 35, 1.8, that beautiful lens that everybody used forever, like on the C, uh, C200, um, that lens would pair beautifully on here. If it was like a native RF mount, that'd be pretty cool. Um, I have used it with just a normal adapter like RF to EF with the 18 to 35 and it works pretty well, but it's, it's pretty slow to focus and it's loud too. the, the focus motors are loud on it, but yeah, like, um, yeah, I, I love the S 35, you know, sensor as well. Like, you know, on my C 200, it's, it always looks great. You know, I've got no problem with shooting video, not being full frame. Um, but it just hurts me that, you know, I'm spending all this money on a cinema camera and I've got all these full frame lenses that I use for my stills as well. And yeah. I can't get the same field of view. Yeah. I don't know. I guess we'll just have to wait for a C70 Mark II to come out uh, or whatever, <laughs> which probably won't happen for another like five years. But um, 
whatever. It's it's canon for you. Like there's always something when it comes to canon as a company, they always do something like this where it's just like one thing is off about it. And it's just it's frustrating that they do that. But yet we still buy yeah. all their stuff every time. <laughs> <laughs> so I almost yeah, no, I mean I almost switched to Sony. Um the A7S3 is very good. Uh so the color is great on it too. The, my problem has always been the color, but I feel like Sony has really nailed it with the A7S III. Have you had any time with that camera? So yes and no. Um, so when I when I freelance for other production companies, you know, probably fifty fifty, they ask me to shoot on my own kit, and then fifty fifty, they ask to shoot on their kit. So I, I get a lot of experience with a lot of different cameras. Um, and one of the clients I started working for this year had the FX3. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it's pretty much the A7S3, but without the viewfinder and it has a fan built in. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, to, to be honest, like I, I've tried to go to Sony myself um, and we don't have to get into that today. You know, I, I love <laughs> the image, but there's just the number of reasons that stop me. Um, but the FX3 really impressed me. The dynamic range on that camera is yeah. like, it's like red level. Oh yeah. It's, it's really amazing. Um, I think if you, if you make the switch to Sony, you have to like really commit, like you have to do a full switch. Like you have to sell all your lenses, all your cameras and buy all native Sony lenses Buy like three bodies, like get an a seven R an FX three and a, and then an a7s3 or whatever like just you have to go full stop otherwise you're not going to really like if you're trying to adapt canon lenses on it you're not going to get a, a good experience um if you buy just an a7s but you're also a photographer you won't be happy because you want more megapixels and more photo features so you kind of have to get like an r and an s at least if you're like yourself you would probably want one of each um, I would imagine because I would imagine as a photographer 12 megapixels isn't acceptable uh, for your for I don't know I, it can be I guess but probably not <laughs> I, I think if um, if they gave us you know if it, if it was the right camera in every other way and it just had a 12 megapixel sensor for the 4k video I think mm -hmm. I could get by with it. You know, I've seen stills from the A7S three, and they're great. Yeah, I, they are great. Yeah, I, mean, for, I don't see the problem. That's why I considered getting it because um, I take pictures of my kids. That's the only thing I take pictures of is my kids and my family and just like normal life. So for me, twelve megapixels is kind of a feature. Like it's to me, that's an. Uh, I prefer to have a smaller megapixel count because I don't want hard drives just full of pictures of my kids that are 50 megapixels you know <laughs> so um i actually prefer a, a lower megapixel count that's why i've stuck with my uh my olympus camera as my main photography camera because i just i love the small form factor to just carry that thing around with me i can take it to a park i can take it you know to disneyland or whatever it's really easy to carry the lenses are tiny um and the files are small because it's only it's actually more megapixels than the a7s it's 20 megapixels but um it's starting to show its age, age though quite a bit uh that micro four thirds sensor like it's noisy my images aren't super sharp um i get a little frustrated with it sometimes so i'm holding out to see what olympus is going to do this year with the whatever their new em1 camera is going to be if it's a if, if, if i'm super let down Again, um, I may finally get rid of the Micro Four Thirds stuff and just buy something else, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm holding on to my EM1 uh, as my primary uh, stills camera. Yeah, sure, sure. And going back to what you said about um, you know the convenience of a lower megapixel sensor. So I shoot a lot of live music, like live music photography, and sometimes when i'm shooting an artist i can shoot up to like four or five thousand images a night oh wow and as you would imagine it's super low light or it's like super contrasty light 
and yeah. shooting on the 45 megapixel R5, 4,000 images overkill. a night, it's, <laughs> it's just, it's impossible. You know, if it weren't for these new M1 Max, I would absolutely be struggling. Yeah, I mean... How are you, how are you finding? How are you finding your, uh, your new M1 Mac? Well... Yeah, so great, great transition. Thank you, uh, camera, for <laughs> for making that transition. Um, yeah, I, so I've got the M1 Max, the 16 inch, and I think I can finally kind of talk about it uh, with, based on my experience with it because I've used it for about two weeks now. Um, and my opinion is, 16 inches is too much for me. Uh, I know a lot of people disagree with that. I used to be a 15 inch user. I also had the 16 inch i9 um, in 2019, but I have gotten used to the smaller 13 inch size and I kind of want to go back to that. Also, I think this newer design um, is a little bit thicker and a little bit heavier and, and just overall bigger. So it just, it feels bigger than ever really. <laughs> and I know everybody can make um, innuendos about everything I'm saying right now. so. You know, have fun thinking about that, you dirty-minded people. Um, but <laughs> other than, but that being said, when it's on the desk, when I'm using it, obviously I'm very grateful for this giant screen because it's it's obviously very usable. Um, but I've talked to a lot of my friends. I post about it on Twitter recently. The consensus seems to be that the 14 inch is actually a little bit bigger than your traditional 13 inch. Obviously, I mean, 14 is bigger than 13. But because it's so bezel-less, um, you're getting more screen real estate than ever. So it actually is a bigger screen, which is nice, but it still retains that portability factor. So um, that's number one. I think I'm going to return this and get a 14 inch. Number two is I maxed this thing out because we bought it sight unseen. Like the day it came out, I called my boss, which is my cousin. And I said, I need to buy this computer. It's really important for my work, you know? And uh, he was like, all right, cool. What What do you want to do with it? I was like, just spec it all the way out. Just maximum everything. And then he was like, how many terabytes do you want for storage? I was like, it's fine. I only need like a terabyte. Don't worry about it. He's like, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna just go ahead and do four terabytes. I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> so I got a four terabyte, 64 gig um, M1 Max. And I don't even tap like any of the potential of this thing at all. Um, I was already really pleased with my M1 Mac mini. Um, and by the way, you just, I think maybe your battery just died. Cameron. Yeah, one sec. I'll just keep ranting. Yeah, yeah, carry on. So um, my, I had a maxed out M1 Mac mini and I felt like that was already pretty awesome. Um, the only issue that I had with it was the the export times were pretty bad. So it would take like, if I did one of these podcasts, for example, and I just did like a, a little basic editing and I just hit export, it would take, you know, if it's an hour long episode, it could take up to 45 minutes to export it, which I felt like was just, you know, not acceptable. So, <clears throat> so I wanted something beefier. Um, this definitely gives me that, um, but at a hefty price tag. I'm going freelance in February, which means I'd have to buy this computer out um, from my cousins. They're not interested in keeping it. So they're either gonna sell it or return it if I didn't buy it from them. And they bought it for like five grand, like it's a little over five grand. And I'm like, I don't wanna spend $5,000 on a laptop. Like it's just a little, it, I'm, not, I'm not using this much power. Uh, I don't need this much RAM. Based on the reviews that I've seen from Max Yurev, um, he's found that like you can totally get away with the base RAM. RAM, especially on these Apple Silicon Macs, is just so optimized and so different than what we're used to with Intel machines. That you know, if you get the M1 Max, you have to go to 32 gigs of RAM for some reason. They they require it, um, but you don't have to spend the extra money to go to the 64 gig. And then there's like two tiers of M1 Max. Um, there's like a, I don't even know the, the differences, but there's, there's two tiers. You can totally go to the, the bottom tier M1 Max and get away with it. Um, heck, you could probably get away with an M1 Pro 
like base model for almost everything. Um, and it's going to be better than my experience with the M1 system, which was already great. So, but what I love about the M1 Max is the dedicated ProRes encoder. And I've been exporting everything in ProRes. I've been like ingesting things in ProRes. I've, because I know this has a ProRes encoder, I've been using ProRes more than ever. And it's so fast and so optimized. And I love that about the M1 Max. So all this to say, I'm going to be returning this machine because it's not mine. It's my cousin's and they don't want it. And I don't want to buy it from them because it's too expensive uh, for me personally. Um, I will then purchase, by the way, it's also silver, which is nice, but look, I'm a pro pros have space gray. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. I know I was, I was trying to fool myself into saying that I like silver <laughs> Um, and a lot of people have decided to go silver this year with the, with these machines. A lot of people actually think that silver looks better. I think it does look good, but Apple has screwed me over and probably a lot of you guys over too into thinking psychologically that space gray equals pro. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's been bothering me every time I look at this silver computer, it bothers me because it's not space gray. I, I swear, yeah, no, absolutely. as stupid as that as stupid as that sounds, I want a space gray one, and my cousins wanted silver <laughs> because it matches their their brand aesthetic more. Um, anyways, I'm gonna return this one. Uh, it's still within the return window, which is great. My cousins will get all their money back. I will purchase the 14 inch. Um, with the bottom line M1 Max, so I'll spec it up to like the cheapest M1 Max option, which, which unfortunately is required to go to 32 gigs of RAM, which is plenty. Um, and then the last option is my storage size. And they got four terabytes on here and it's been a real joy not having to think about storage, but it's so expensive to go to four terabytes. In my heart, I want to go to four terabytes, but my wallet says two terabytes is probably the maximum amount of money I can spend on this thing. There we go. All um, right. Yeah, so basically I use the, um, the Canon utility webcam software and it's just a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you get one, to of use... these, um, one of these things, the uh, cam link 4K Elgato thing or, you know, some sort of capture device. Oh yeah. HDMI. I I've, I've tried to use that EOS utility thing and it's a pain in the butt. You want to just get yeah. some sort of HDMI converter thing. Yeah, basically you have to use OBS to like basically yeah. make Zoom recognize the um the the webcam. But yeah, sorry about that. But yeah, basically uh you were saying about the M1 Mac M1 Max. Um Yeah, I don't I don't know if you heard uh, my whole rant, but basically I have decided did, that yeah. it's a little overkill for me based on the reviews. Now that I've seen them, a maxed out M one max really is overkill for most video editors. Um, it's yeah. a luxury. Like if you can afford it, if you got unlimited money, then of course go at it. The more GPU power you have, like the better, obviously, but in a realistic sense, like, a base model 14 inch is outperforming a maxed out Intel uh, MacBook from two years ago. So, th I mean, that alone is nuts because I spent, I think, $4,000 on a maxed out i9 16 inch when that first came out. Like, remember when they went from the 15 inch to the 16 inch, they fixed the keyboard and they kind of they made the bezels a little smaller and made it a 16 inch you know laptop i think it was 2019 when that came out i bought that one it's still at the touch bar and all that crap and the four usb ports but um the, apparently the the 14 inch m1 pro base model outperforms a spec a, a, a maxed out previous machine so that alone should tell you like you don't have to go all the way up on on the m1 max unless you're like a, a video game developer or a 3D animator or something like that. 
the fact that you can do like 3D animation on a laptop is nuts. So very exciting stuff for sure from Apple. Yeah, for sure. And like, yeah, I totally agree. Um, so I have the the 14 inch pretty much baseline model. It's the um, the baseline model with the terabyte hard drive upgrade. That's what I was thinking of doing too. It's just so much cheaper yeah. to go that way. And how, how have you liked it? it? Absolutely. Yeah, it absolutely flies. Like I've never used the computer so quick. That's awesome. You know, I I can open and I, I demonstrate this to like a few other filmmakers. Um, I can open every single app in the applications folder, like sixty five apps all at once. They all just fire up instantly, <laughs> and I can still scrub in Premiere Pro, like. Not not even Final Cut, Premiere Pro. Um, yeah. I can still scrub the C70 footage smooth wow. as butter. That's amazing that even in Premiere, you're getting that kind of uh, feedback because obviously Adobe still hasn't fully optimized their apps yet. Um, I think they finally released a an Apple Silicon kind of supported version, but I'm sure over time they'll continue to optimize uh, the app. Because Final Cut and Resolve both both perform so much better on the Silicon uh, compared to uh, Premiere, unfortunately. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, uh, Premiere Pro has always always had really poor performance on MacBooks, so it's just so refreshing that we finally have a computer that can actually handle kind of difficult to edit codecs like for example with the r5 or the r3 or the r6 um yeah i could never i could never edit any of the footage on my old mac i had to transcode every single clip to prores and then edit that and that would add six hours to any 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 edit you know so what would be your recommendation for someone listening right now who's maybe still working on a on an Intel machine or maybe even somebody that did buy an M1 Mac last year who is kind of hitting the limits of its capability? Do you recommend your your um, purchase, basically a base model 14-inch? Um, and then obviously if you have room in your budget to, to upgrade the storage, you know, do that if you want kind of a thing? Yeah, well, I mean, what I would say is that you can always you can always return and upgrade. You know, Apple's return policy is so relaxed, and they they almost encourage it as long as you don't kind of abuse it on on a level. But um, you can always start with the baseline, throw your footage at it, throw a couple edits that you think would it, you know represent the way you'll be working for the next five ten years. And if you find you're not quite getting the performance you need, you can always upgrade. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe I should do that. I think you've talked me into that because I would save <laughs> like a thousand dollars or more not having to upgrade to the M1 Max. Um, just going with the Pro. I just, I that's think it. their marketing has tricked me into thinking I want that Max for that dedicated uh prores encoder or whatever but if you're getting performance that still flies on the base model with c70 which is all i'm doing uh, as well i'm only using the c70 uh you know yeah absolutely fine even even some of the more difficult to edit codecs like the the mp5 codecs from the c70 it's um well, it's the MP4 codex, isn't it? But it's H265, right? H265, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's it, yeah. Even they, 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 they scrub and smooth perfectly. I'm sure if you stacked, you know, 10 of them and added, you know, warp stabilizer and denoise or a color grade to them, then you might sure. start to see Premiere Pro slip. But I guarantee you Final Cut in that exact scenario will still fly. Yeah, I've only been in Final Cut for the last 11 years and uh, I've been very grateful that I made the switch because no matter what computer I've been on, it's always it's always performed so well on Mac. Um, it's actually, what's your reason for staying with Premiere? Is it to, to work with others? And I think a lot of 
my friends who are on Premiere, the reason they are on Premiere is because so many other people are on it. You know, you just get so used to something you don't want to change, but like when other things are outperforming it so greatly, that doesn't that doesn't convince you to to switch at all or or at least entice you a little bit. Yeah, it definitely did in the beginning. Um but I mean there are a couple reasons why I want to try and stay with Premiere. Um I'd say number one is the the color grade. I find the the luminetry colors is just so easy to work with and perhaps it's just because I know it, but I find that whenever I try to color grade in Final Cut, I just can't quite get the look I'm after because there's not quite as many tools from my from my experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'd also say, um, yeah, working with other filmmakers as well, you know, if they're not on a Mac or they're on Premiere, then I can share the edit files and, and go that way. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty, um, industry standard really at this point, most people are on Premiere. Um, you can kind of assume that they will be, but a lot of my friends, you know, that are YouTubers are all on Final Cut because it's just so much faster and for me when i was doing youtube full time it was literally we we would shoot in the morning we'd start at like 10 o'clock me and connor would start at 10 and then by by one or two we'd be done shooting and then we'd have like a a late lunch and then from three until six we'd edit export upload schedule for the next morning like we would do all that in one day. And the only reason we could do that is because of Final Cut. Like it was just so fast. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there were a couple of things that really bugged me about Final Cut though. Like I hate that when you throw a clip into the timeline, it like magnets back to the beginning of the timeline. Do you get what mm. I mean? That's the best part. That's the best feature once you learn to harness it. <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah it's, true. when you don't when you're not used to it um it sucks but when you do learn to use it i i promise it's i can't that's why i can't use premiere is because it doesn't have that i feel like i'm walking through mud because it's so slow for me but it's also because i've been on final cut for 11 years now i just that's the only way that i think you know yeah i definitely think I could move to Final Cut and I, I I do want to try, but it's just like when you've been using a piece of software for exactly, you know, seven, eight years, it's like, it's so hard to just make that change. You know, it's like the same with any, any other camera accessory or, um, I just think, you know, piece of gear. I just, I do think it's nuts that I paid $300 for Final Cut 11 years ago. And that was the last time I ever paid anything for it. And I, I've continued to get free updates. It's been blazing fast on every machine I've I've used it on. Um, I mean, you know, you can't argue with that, right? Like, you don't. I don't have to pay fifty dollars a month for it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I think if you don't take advantage of you know the Adobe suite, you know, with like After Effects or yeah. yeah. Um, Lightroom or Premiere Pro. I still, I pay for the photo bundle because I I use uh, okay. light I use Lightroom and Photoshop all the time. Yeah, gotcha. I can't. I've tried messing around with other options like um, uh, I I do use Pixelmator Pro every once in a while. It's very optimized on Apple Silicon. If you ever just want like a really quick, like you don't want to just you don't want to open up Photoshop. The thought of opening it up is daunting because it just takes forever for it to load and then just clunky. If you just want to do like some quick editing, Pixelmator is great. I highly recommend it. It's like 30 bucks, um, but it still does not have all the features of Photoshop. So um, you kind of have to have Photoshop. And then when it comes to editing thousands of images, there's nothing like Lightroom. There's literally nothing on the market at all that competes with Lightroom. Um, there's Capture One. There's what else there's like one other one but they're not the same it's not as well designed as lightroom in my opinion and it's weird that nobody has made like a a lightroom ripoff it must be a hard thing to do i don't know 
Yeah, I mean, it'd be nice if Apple would approach. Um, I know, you yeah, know, uh, an attempt at Lightroom, wouldn't it? I know they used to have an app called Aperture. Aperture. Yep. Yeah. It was great. One of my best friends, Jeffrey Holland. He that's all he used. He's a huge Aperture fan, and a lot of people were. Really. Um, yeah, but it's huh. it's not a. They they just they dropped it. I don't know. It's weird. <clears throat> All right, so to kind of close us out, I would like for you to share um, just some words of wisdom to anybody out there that is like you, who's hustling, who's doing the freelance um, grind. I've been there. I'm about to be in the game again <laughs> coming up next year a little bit more. Um, any inspiring thoughts or any mistakes that you've made that you've learned from that you could share some wisdom with, with the audience tonight? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say like, try not to get caught up in what other people are doing and kind of, you know, try and focus on what's important to you. Like, for example, I've noticed in the filmmaking industry that kind of the love of like gear and cameras and camera tech and technology is kind of you know, it, it's kind of like a, it's a bad word in the industry that, you know, they, people think that if that's all you're interested in, then you're not a filmmaker. But yeah, I found for myself, the technology and the excitement of experimenting and seeing how technology can aid my creativity mm-hmm. is actually what spurs me to carry on doing what I'm doing. You know, if, if I had to shoot on the same camera for the rest of my life, I'd probably fall out of love with filmmaking pretty quick, I reckon. You know, it, it's... But yeah, like, I'm not saying gear is everything or or nothing. I'm just saying, for me, I found that gear was quite, uh, you know, an important part of what kept me interested. Yeah, it kept me it kept me interested in, in carrying on doing what I'm doing. Um, and like another piece of advice, I'd say like, if anyone wants to get into freelance, um, camera work or any, any, any element of the filmmaking industry, I'd say just make friends with people like every, Mm. every opportunity I've ever come across has been through a friend that I've made somewhere down the line somewhere. So yeah, I think networking is is such a big tool if, if you use it right. Absolutely. I can't agree more. I here in Nashville would just go to local coffee shops to edit. And um, if you happen to live in a city, uh, especially a city that may have some sort of creative industry, um, I would highly recommend just going out, just going to coffee shops. Cause I can't tell you how many times I would like, run into a friend that I, sh- I was on a shoot with like at a coffee shop and then it just strikes up a conversation. And then before you know it, they're like, you know what? I have a shoot coming up next week. I really need some help. Would you, could you help me out? You know, or even like editing in public and it's like a stranger just seeing you edit and they're like, Oh, do you do video stuff? Yeah. I'm a producer. Like, you know, I don't know that that's been my experience here in Nashville, which is sort of an industry town that may not happen in every city. Um, and if you're young and you, you have the ability to move and you, you're considering moving to, uh, a more industry based city, I think it's worth trying it at least. Um, I know for me, I grew up kind of in the suburbs of, of Nashville. And then when I was in my early twenties, I just moved, I moved downtown and I lived with three other guys who were all video guys. And it was a great time in my life because we were all working together. Like I would just meet other, other people, uh, working in the industry, music videos, a lot of things here in Nashville. Um, there's in America, there's lots of great cities, Chicago, Atlanta, Nashville, New York, LA, even Louisiana now is doing crazy stuff. Austin, Texas, um, is blowing up. So, and then I don't know about you, but what, what are some industry towns in, in, uh, England, London, to be honest, in- <laughs> Yeah, in England, um, in, well, England, you can kind of travel across quite, quite quickly. So I guess that's even true. if you're, 
America's yeah. so freaking Even, big. It's like it's like we're all different countries. <laughs> Every state's a different country, essentially. That's it. Yeah. So even if you're not in London, like like myself, um, it doesn't stop you because everyone yeah. more or less has to travel to freelance gigs anyway. So whether sure. you're in the big cities or not, I wouldn't let that defer you from trying to find work. Yeah. But yeah, like going back to my point about um, making friends and, you know, uh, going into freelance work. Like, honestly, I think it's true that people hire their friends before they hire strangers. Yeah. At least I do. And everyone I've ever worked with does. You know, essentially, it's it's nepotism. It's it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because people <laughs> want to work with people want to work with problem solvers, and they want to work with people that are, you know, trustworthy. They, they they can yeah that they can trust and they know what they're getting. Because if you hire a stranger, you never really know what you're getting. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I can't say that this really relates to the YouTube world or anything like that. Because well, maybe it does. You know, I see lots of YouTubers friends with other youtubers and they kind of use each other to to yeah level each other up in ways you know yeah i i know for me personally when i met other youtubers i just latched on to them because it is such a unique uh job that when you find someone else that is similar it's kind of like oh finally somebody i could talk to about this you know um YouTube's different. Uh, YouTube's a little different because you really are working for yourself. So I don't know, but yeah, I I think um, what you're talking about, like making friends in the industry and and being trustworthy, being honest, showing up on time, being kind, um, those are all things that just that's way more valuable to a producer who's going to hire you in the future than. Um, you know, being a great shooter, but being kind of an asshole, you know? <laughs> so, sure, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, even, even in some examples I've found, I mean, not, not all examples, but in some examples I've found that you, you don't even have to be the best person for the job. Sometimes mm-hmm. you just have to be, you know, friends with someone or, you know, you have to be approachable. You have to be fun to be around. That's what I've found. Yeah, totally. A hundred percent. And some of the best, some of the best people in the industry are also some of the, you know, some, sometimes some of the, the most talented people in the industry are also, you know, very kind people as well. Um, I've heard some great stories about Roger Deakins, you know, he's, he's from England. Um, and, uh, from what I've heard, he just sounds like the nicest guy, you know, but he's also one of the best cinematographers, uh, in Hollywood, you know, so, um, to be yeah. fair, when, when you're the boss or the director or someone with a bit more, um, you know, when you're a bit more in charge of the project, that might be a slightly different question. Have you seen, <laughs> have you seen the video by Max Joseph? It's called Dicks. Yes. I love that video. I remember, um, discovering that because of Casey Neistat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great video. The whole idea that, you know, do you have to be a dick to be a good boss? <laughs> and it, the answer is kind of yes. Cause like, you know, Max, Max gives examples of him being, you know, everyone's friend on set as the director and mm-hmm. him giving examples about how that's like not always the right move. But yeah, I think as a freelancer, you know, when you're, if, yeah, if you're not the director or whoever, then yeah, just make friends with people because you never know (laughs) who is going to throw an opportunity your way. Even if you make friends with someone who's not specifically behind the camera or in a role that you kind of aspire to be in. Yeah. Somewhere down the line, they will be presented with an opportunity where they'll be asked for recommendations. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you're the first person that comes to mind, you could be the first person to get that job. Absolutely. 100% agree. Everybody go check out Cameron's stuff. Uh, give him a follow on Instagram, video.cameron. We'll link it, of course, in the show notes. 
of this podcast and in the description of the video. Cameron, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, for talking. It was a pleasure meeting you. Um, I always love nerd, nerding out about gear stuff. Um, if I'm ever in England, I'll have to hit you up. Um, maybe we can meet up with Philip and Kai and have uh, have a coffee sometime. That'd be super fun. <laughs> That'd be great. Thanks so much for having me, Dave. Awesome. Thank you.